I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Before I go too far into this topic, I would like to speak about the releasing and receiving that are implicit in generosity. The Buddha focused on generosity a lot, and this time of year, certainly in America, with things like Giving Tuesday and so forth, there's a lot of focus on generosity. If you think about the nature of generosity of all kinds, there is both a releasing of that which we are giving, that which we are offering, and there is a receiving of the thankfulness, sometimes at least, of the people we're giving to. Uh, there's a receiving of a knowing of our own generosity. Um, the Buddha recommended a receiving of a gladness in your own goodness, which helps to keep motivating us uh, to engage the goodness of generosity. There are many forms of generosity. Uh, in our culture, we tend to over monetize generosity. It's all about the money. And in fact, most generosity is not monetized. It's uh, typically intangible. The generosity of attention, of practice, of restraint, of patience, uh, the generosity of love, and sometimes forms of generosity that are tangible but are not monetized. No. You know, the gifts of service, for example. And still, we live in a world in which, um, and an economy in which um, there is a place for the money that enables people to buy food, keep the lights on, you know, take care of their bodies, take care of their loved ones, keep their organizations running, uh, keep employing people that do things. And as you may know, uh, I invite people to experience the benefits of generosity in whatever ways they want. I myself uh, have the generosity of giving this time, giving these teachings, uh, the generosity of my friends and teachers flowing through me, out to you, uh, all good, good stuff. Uh, I rarely talk about uh, generosity in a formal way in these Wednesday uh, gatherings. Uh, this is one of the first I've done for probably close to at least a year now. And in particular, to the extent that you would like to offer generosity uh, to me or for the sake of me, I invite you to do it for the sake of the Global Compassion Coalition. Uh, it's an organization, a nonprofit, tax deductible, um, that I founded with friends and colleagues from around the world. I just put the link to the donation page for it. Um, compassion is profoundly needed in our world today. We can see the lack of compassion uh, in conflict zones around the world. We can see the lack of compassion in systemic sources of suffering, such as chronic poverty for children and others in America, uh, injustice, uh, the perpetuation of systems that advantage the few at the cost of the many. And in this organization, the uh, Global Compassion Coalition, we are building a literally an international hub of resources for compassion, drawing on science and spirituality together from around the world, and a related coalition that now is approaching 110,000 people, 110,000 people and organizations growing by several thousand a week. And if you're interested in supporting that cause, if you're moved, to support the cause of compassion uh, in our world. Perhaps you're moved out of gratitude to me. Uh, I invite you to uh, consider going to the uh, donation page that I'm putting in the chat here and wandering through the website of the Global Compassion Coalition and seeing if that's something that you care to donate to. If not, no worries. Um, Perhaps you routinely, you know, leave a little money at kind of in a tip jar almost for each of these weekly gatherings. This week, if you like, you can leave it at that link, 
globalcompassioncoalition.org. If you're also moved, you can join the coalition. You can join the movement. Um, you can look around through the website and see some of the many distinguished organizations and individuals who are already participating. The more people we are, the stronger we are uh, to be a force for good uh, on the world stage. So that's my talk about generosity, which contains within it um, both uh, a letting go and a letting in in a beautiful combination. And uh, my own practice um, has kind of jumped at various points along the way. And definitely one of the big jumps recently has been a, a recently like the last 10 years recently, but it's been a real focus on generosity. And I invite you into that focus in whatever ways you like, including perhaps donating to the Global Compassion Coalition. Okay. So now I'd like to speak more broadly about a third great form of wise effort, releasing and receiving. Uh, the first kind of wise effort I focused on in this series was the sense of being already home as the foundation for everything else, at home in your body, at home in the present, at home in the world. Second, I talked about the wise effort in three major kinds of practice. I think of this as the essence of practice, uh, loving, knowing, and growing. And there was some lively discussion last week about the word love, and I understand that different words have understandable associations for different people. Feel very free to substitute your own word of choice. Um, caring, kindness, compassion, heart, whatever it might be for you. Basically, I'm speaking there about the classic um, themes in Buddhism of metta, sati, and bhavana. Um, metta, loving kindness, sati, mindfulness, bhavana, development, uh, learning. That's the, se that's the second great topic we explored here in terms of wise effort. And now I'd like to speak with you about releasing and then to speak about um, receiving. So <clears throat> if, you know, the classic point, if we don't let go, we become full of it, of one thing or another. And if we hold our breath, uh, we're not exhaling, we're not releasing, we can't receive. So I'm deliberately starting with releasing because as we create space, we can let in. Um, <clears throat> you probably know the, the Zen story. Briefly, a famous professor who had tremendous knowledge about the history and philosophy of Zen came to meet the great Zen master who invited the professor to tea. And so the professor was really excited. Oh, I'm going to be served tea by the Zen master. And the professor, while the tea was preparing, uh, started expounding on various philosophies of Buddhism and consciousness and reality and this and that. Uh, and the Zen master just kept smiling and prepared the tea, and set the cup in front of the professor. And then as the professor was sort of droning on, the Zen master began very slowly pouring tea into the cup. And the tea began rising in the cup. The professor began to notice that the tea was approaching the rim. And then the Zen master just kept very benevolently pouring until the tea overflowed the cup and began to spread out throughout the entire table. Stop, stop, the professor said. Don't you know? It's full already. You can't pour anything else into it. And then... The Zen master said, exactly, lifted the cup and emptied it to the side and then set it, set it down again. You cannot put anything into uh, a space that is already full. If you think of it, what's the most valuable attribute of a cup? It's emptiness, it's space inside. Uh, as Suzuki Roshi, a uh, Zen master indeed, said, in the beginner's mind are many possibilities. There's an openness there, a receptivity. In the expert's mind, like the professors, are very few. So it's really important to um, appreciate broadly in our practice, in our wise efforts as we go through life, the general principle 
of letting go. Um, it is said that um, in the universe are three great processes, um, creation, preservation, and destruction. Starting, continuing, and stopping. Beginning, developing, completing. And in our culture, that's very acquisitive. It's very much about holding on, holding on. We tend to underestimate the value in letting go. Uh, the principle of minimalism, and uh, in the documentary, I actually had a minor role uh, uh, of, about minimalism. Uh, minimalism is a bit of a counter to that. The, the notions of voluntary simplicity. Um, there's some kind of catchphrase that uh, is really appropriate. Somebody might want to put it into the chat. You know, living simply so that others may simply live. Because as our own patterns of consumption uh, do all kinds of things, in, including being involved with patterns of impoverishing others, uh, extracting from them. So as a bit of a counter to the culture and systems and scripts and assumptions we live in, highlighting the value of letting go is really useful. Also in our bodies, I was speaking with Farah uh, before our official beginning about emotion that's stored in the body and what to do with it. Uh, if, we do, if we just hold on to various patterns and if we hold on to their somatic markers and the, the character armor, that Wilhelm Reich and others have talked about, if we hold on to all that, uh, we're stuck with it. We're stuck with it. It's lodged inside us. Um, it has invaded us. It has occupied us. It has established itself inside us. We need to help it let go, help it soften, help it break apart, help it disentangle, let it go. Otherwise, we tend to be stuck with all that. So in your own life these days, as we explore this topic, it's easy for it to be way too abstract. You might bring it down to earth. Like right now, is there a holding in your body that's unnecessary? And might you shift your posture into a position that, as I'm doing right now, is helping you to let go? Bringing these ideas down into embodied, lived experience. With me, if you could, make a fist. Imagine that you're holding a stone in your hand or a jewel or something you want, right? And notice what it feels like as you keep holding with your strength. And then what is it like to turn your hand over and release the stone? What's the difference between the two? Um, you can also imagine that you're trying to pull something toward yourself. You're trying to grab it. You're trying to own it. You're trying to possess it. Feel the pressure of that, the intensity of that. And then what's it like to just let it go? Or imagine you're pushing something away, a feeling, an experience some information, you don't want to know about it. Whatever it is, you're pushing it away. Somebody you don't like, they bother you. Feel the force of that. The strain in your arms, letting go. The way all your attention collapses around that which you're resisting. And then let go. What's that like? Know what it's like to let go. Know what it feels like, the way it's helpful, um, the, the pleasure in it. Um, I think of these two great, um, uh, wonderful experiences that are highly underrated, I think of, of them, R&R, &R, reassurance and relief, All right? As we experience reassurance and relief, we let go of anxieties. We let go of worries that are not helping us. 
we let go. So you might imagine these days, what's something in particular that you'd like to let go of? It could be a simple thing. Uh, you know, maybe <laughs> you look in your closet or uh, your living room and you see something there that you just know, you know, I can let that go. I can give it away. I can throw it away. I can let it go. Or in your um, in your body, there might be a chronic sense of pressure. I have a lot of um, things to do. I still choose to have a lot of things to do. And in my relationship to them, a fair amount of useful practice is about having a lot of things to do in a limited amount of time without feeling any pressure about it. Even things that have a lot of consequences, I really have to get them done in a limited amount of time, but can I do the doingness efficiently, briskly, um, swiftly? Can I do that without feeling pressured? Right? Maybe that's a thing you'd like to let go of. Or is there a chronic sense of contraction in your body? Perhaps around certain people. You know, they're not coming at you, you know, with a weapon. Uh, they're, they're just, <laughs> you just get triggered around them or, you know, defensive or defended around them. And you know, do you need to be so, do you need to be contracted around them? What would it be like to let go of that contraction? This is extremely useful at a time of year when we are often with people that we tend to be contracted around. What would it be like to kind of soften in the front, soften in the back, not be contracted? That's specific, right? Um, Maybe you've been, I'm going to use a loaded word here, stingy or possessive, really. You've been holding on to something that you know. Maybe you've been worried about a certain amount of money, spending it on something. Yeah. Maybe you've um, just been unwilling to shift your position about something, your view. And that's creating conflict with other people. You become attached to a particular point of view. Is that worth letting go? You might want to make a little list. <laughs> Hold on to that list. Don't let go of the list of what you want to let go. Right? How about the sense of... Um, of self, right? That's a real one to let go increasingly, the sense of being a, a contracted, solidified entity inside. Instead, there can be a letting go into a sense of process. Right? It's very helpful to be aware of fear around letting go, letting go of ego, letting go of being right, letting go around certain roles. Um, you know, I've had family members whose role was to be the knower, the one who knew, and that created trouble for them, you know, going through school. And uh, are you in a role? I, I, particularly roles that get rewarded and then internalized. I have to be careful about the ways in which, you know, I'm paid to know stuff, <laughs> right? And then you gotta be careful 
Uh, you know, pe- if your role is to be the person in the room who's who understands things or has good recommendations, can do you get identified with those roles? There's a place for, uh, you know, knowing stuff and being skillful and place for those things. Um, <clears throat> but do we get identified with that mode of relating to others? Are we identified with that role in the script? Can we step out of that role? Can we explore the opposite of that role without extreme discomfort in order to become freer? Like, can you, if you're, for example, the person who's typically the the one who knows, maybe in your relationships, you know, you're the one who's more emotionally intelligent. Well, what would it be like? to deliberately step into the an experience of, maybe if only play acting for fun, of being emotionally unintelligent, clueless, like uh, the person who needs a lot of therapy. Uh. <laughs> what would it be like to be that one in a relationship, just deliberately? And you can see there's a, there's a lot of value in letting go, in releasing. So let's see here. And then really quite profoundly, in a very Buddhist sense, um, actually before I go there, I want to talk about two, two things more concretely to, to consider. What about letting go of conflicts with others? You know, ongoing struggle with them. I don't mean being a marshmallow or letting them walk on top of you. I just mean getting out of the contentiousness, like not not bickering, not quarreling. People often have a mode of relating that involves optimal distance. So they relate through bickering or, or fussing and feuding or hassling and haranguing each other. But they they kind of orbit each other. They never really release, but they never really part ways. It's a mode of attaching. It's a mode of relating through a kind of contentiousness, uh, a recurring quarrel about this or that. Well, maybe you could step out of that role if you're in it. Um, One of the things that's been very prominent for me lately in my own journey has been realizing I, I have spent a fair amount of time trying to get people to care about certain things that I care about, and I think they ought to care about, but they don't really care about very much, and they're just not going to. And so that creates a kind of conflict with them where I'm trying to get them to care, and they just don't care. And um, that's something maybe we could let go of, right? Entanglements with other people too, getting stuck, stuck in a certain scripts where you're a giver and they're a taker. Stepping out of those, letting go of that, even if it's kind of central to your role as a man or a woman or beyond gender, you know, those kind of entanglements. Sometimes letting go of other people altogether, just letting them go, even if they're family members. As we age, you know, estrangements can occur with people who just will not repair. Even if you had some part in the estrangement, maybe no part at all, depending, they won't repair. Well, can we let go? Or we start realizing there's certain people in our lives who've just sort of taken a turn. They were our college roommate or dear friend, and they've just gotten kind of strange. (laughs) Or only fixed about something politically or otherwise. Uh, And it's just not very alive to talk with them anymore. Or the only thing they want to talk about is, you know, Roger Federer in his retirement or something. And you're just not that into it anymore. Maybe we let them go. Maybe we send them a holiday card every year. We have lunch once a year, but otherwise we kind of let it go. Another one to be aware of that's concrete is letting go of obstructions inside yourself or that you maintain around you to your own wholesome desires, aims, values, and dreams. Whoa, obstructions. You know, putting things off, that's an obstruction. Putting off action. 
um, saying to yourself, well, I'll do it when. I'll do it, I'll, I'll, I'll start dancing again when I've lost 10 pounds. And yet the days and years go by. Do you, can you let go of that obstruction and go dancing with the body you have, right? Um, so what those, or maybe there's a fear of putting your poetry out into the world so people can see it or standing up somewhere and singing your song. Can you let go of the self-doubt as an obstruction? Can you let go of your rationalizations about why you know you just can't do it or you're not allowed to do it or why you should perfect things even further? Maybe those are obstructions that your intuition is telling you to let go. We're approaching the beginning of a new year in the, the Western calendar and this is a time to let go of obstructions to living the life fully, your one wild and precious life, as Mary Oliver put it. Okay. And then there's a fundamental kind of letting go that in Buddhism is really, really profound. It's the letting go of clinging, the letting go of attachments. There's an emptying out. Suzuki Roshi, to quote him again, said that enlightenment is letting go of this moment while growing into the next one in a context in which, as he sp speaks, emptying yourself out in each moment with no presumption that you will remain alive for the next one. That's a high bar. And obviously, as we do these practices of letting go, we wanna be careful we don't get dissociative or psychotic or, you know, it's important sometimes to kind of hold on to something that's grounding so the kite can soar holding on appropriately to the sense of ongoingness of being so that you can really allow the edges to soften, to blur on out into everything, opening into the emptiness of everything. Um, there's this beautiful um, story that I love. Uh, I'll read uh, the way I wrote it in my book, Neurodharma. For example, one moonlit evening in 13th century Japan, the Zen nun Mugai Nyodai was carrying water in an old bucket made of bamboo strips. It suddenly broke and she had an awakening. I particularly like this version of her enlightenment poem from the writer Mary Swigonsky. With this and that, I tried to keep the bucket together and then the bottom fell out. Where water does not collect, the moon does not dwell. I'll put that into the chat. So imagine that. Imagine that. The reflection of the moon, the surface of the bucket, the moonlit night, suddenly the bottom falls out. With it, the moon, self-world, boundaries blur. So there can be an emptying out even into each moment, into the emptiness of each moment, you know, in ways that can really be very profound. As the Buddha put it, clinging to nothing, ultimately, nothing at all, abiding in groundlessness, clinging to nothing at all in this or any world. Profound form of wise effort, isn't it? Making the subtle efforts ultimately to release effort altogether. But along the way, like the proverbial raft that we use as an intermediate vehicle, we can engage the effort of releasing until we release anyone who appears to be releasing and release releasing itself as we abide emptily in everything. And then there is receiving. Gosh, something else happening alongside releasing is receiving. You know, we're receiving while inhaling. And so I invite you here as well to consider that which you would like to let in more. You can release barriers to letting in 
I learned a fundamental kind of meditation from a teacher of mine, um, Da Frijan, uh, Adi Da Lavananda, many years ago. He called it the prayer of changes, in which, in harmony with the breath, first we release, we release obstructions to that which we'd like to receive, inner obstructions, outer obstructions. We release it out into the universe, into mystery. And then when it feels right, we shift into receiving that which we'd like to have in our life or receiving ways of being in our life. Often fairly quickly, obstructions arise to that receiving. Then we shift back into releasing, focusing on releasing those obstructions, those doubts, those um, thoughts about other people who will stop us. Then when it feels right and there's space again, we receive we focus on receiving into the space that remains as we have let go. Uh, in the three great modes of practice that I talk about, let, a, let be, let go, let in, Af after we let be, we be with what's there, and then if it's appropriate, we focus on releasing it, we let it go. Then in the space that's left after we let it go, we let in. It's as if we pull the weeds in the garden of the mind and then we plant flowers and fruits in the space that they have left behind. There's a great process here. So you might ask yourself, what is it you'd like to let into your life these days now that you're making more room for it through what you're releasing? Are there new kinds of attitudes and perspectives you'd like to let in? Would you like to let in more pleasure for your sweet and long-suffering body? Wholesome pleasures, rest, comfort, nice soft <laughs> pale blue flannel or corduroy, soft corduroy shirts. What would you like to let in? What kind of um, aesthetic pleasures of a flower? a scent, a pleasurable taste. Would you like to let into your life more of, more beauty? Would you like to let in more breaks? Oof, <laughs> I could use more breaks. <laughs> I'm gonna remember this one. Uh, you know, letting that in. A uh, little more time, a little more respite between the rushes. Most of us really could afford to pause for a breath or three or 10 uh, at multiple points during our day, but we don't tend to give ourselves that pause. And yet it would do wonders for the stress chemistry in the body, for even for our longevity. Let that in. Are there people you would like to let into your life more? That, you're, that you want to reach out to more, invite more. You know, people that maybe you have lunch with every three months, maybe that's the extent of it, but it's still a meaningful relationship. Um, you know, people in good company. The Buddha was a very practical, practical, practical man. And he highly recommended good company. There's so much dharma in early Buddhism, which is his own teachings really directly uh, about the value of good company and the usefulness of letting go of those that don't really feed us for whatever reason, bless them, but and see ya. Uh, and then letting in uh, those who we really wanna spend more time with. Lately, I've been reflecting, as I said, on letting go of trying to get people to care about things they just won't care about and spending more time letting in, for me, people at this stage of my life who um, really do care about certain things, notably changing systemic sources of suffering, uh, growing focus for me, uh, having focused on changing individual factors of suffering in my 50 year career so far, but shifting more to that, looking for people who really care about that 
and are um, implementing their caring in effective ways, not just wringing their hands or signing petitions or writing manifestos, as good as that may be, but they're actually taking effective action with others collectively to change systemic sources of suffering. So letting in, who might you want to let in more of at this age and stage for you? Right? Also, what a beautiful practice of recognizing um, how much we receive. You know, all the atoms in our body are given to us by the world. They tend to cycle through. Most of the atoms in your body are replaced over half a dozen years. A few probably remain, but most of them, certainly all of the water, all of the oxygen, you know, and, and hydrogen in the water in your body is replaced very rapidly over short periods of time. Wow, you know, we're, we're, we're made by the world. And, you know, the, those atoms, any of them that are bigger than helium, oxygen, iron, calcium, made inside a star that blew up. And all those little atoms drifted through space to be received by our solar system, gradually coalescing into the sun and its planets and into your body now. We are walking stardust, you know, <laughs> breathing stardust, drinking stardust, stardust walking into and out of your front door. Received, right? That's pretty wild. And then there's something quite intimate. And I talked about this with Farah earlier about the process so-called of linking. And you can learn more, and more about that in my materials about the HEAL process of taking in the good. Uh, there are a lot of freely available things on my website. You can also see my book, Hardwiring Happiness, or the online training or also taught by others in person, the positive neuroplasticity training. When we link, we connect something wholesome, beneficial, positive with something missing or wounded or quote unquote negative so that the beneficial flows into the pain and eases and soothes it and, and feeds it and gradually replaces it like flowers replacing weeds. Well, you might ask yourself, okay, what does my heart long for that I may not be receiving, but I could? Maybe I'm turning away from it or I'm denying that I long for it. I'm not even looking for it because I don't want to admit how much I miss it, how much I want it. Or maybe there's a fear that if you let in what you long for, you will become dependent on it or some dependent on a person. Or that, who knows, it might mean that you have to give up complaining about that and being resentful or reproachful about that. You know, in ways that are very normal. What might your heart be longing for these days? And can you let it in? And can you let it flow all the way in? to the places that are hurting inside, the places that are longing inside, filling yourself up. It's okay to fill the cup you know, with what it longs for. And then to finish here, we have the two together in any moment, don't we? We have this great mystery of arising and passing away, passing away and arising continually. And um, one thing that I've talked about and taught about elsewhere is that alongside the focus in Buddhism of um, impermanence, framed as uh, the unsatisfactoriness of each moment I find that that translation of impermanence or is really mistaken because 
even if it's not even mistranslated, the present moment is not inherently unsatisfactory due to its endingness. It's unsatisfactory only if we try to hold on to it. Yes, no, nothing that is impermanent can provide permanent happiness or satisfaction. Got it. But that doesn't mean it's unsatisfactory. When we say something is unsatisfactory, that is, is a criticism of it. That is a kind of aversion to it. You know, if we go to a, if we eat a meal and we say to our friend afterward, that was really unsatisfactory. <laughs> That's a critique. The present moment is not inherently unsatisfactory. And remember that even if its endingness is occurring, it's continuously being replaced by the new next thing because we live continually in creation as the four-dimensional space-time universe continues to expand, including in, in its dimension of time. You know, The endingness of each moment is due to the givingness of the next one arising, including the arisingness of the next moment of our own beingness given to us by all the causes and conditions in the universe. Those are facts and cause for continuous celebration, even as we keep releasing and not clinging to anything in this or any world of that which is continuously passing through. We are each um, like a standing wave moving over a boulder in a river, continually moving through us, continually renewed by the causing of the factors upstream. What a beautiful thing. We can live right in the middle of releasing, receiving, receiving, releasing, now and now and now. And we can make wise efforts to abide there. And we can make wise efforts, as I've talked with you tonight about, about the particulars of different kinds of wise releasing, wise letting go, saying goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and wise welcoming, a lovely term from Galen Ferguson, great teacher and scholar at Naropa University, is focused on welcoming, welcoming what is arising, what is coming, what we are receiving. There's a lot of value in both of those practices and making wise efforts in each of them. Like hear the bell. <laughs> Sound receiving, releasing continuously. Even receiving the emptying of its silence as it fades away. There, there is a receiving and a releasing and a releasing and a receiving that is moving through us that is vaster and more powerful than anything we can control. And we can um, release resistance to that, and we can receive the wisdom that knows that we are each in this moment, like the wave, made and changing continuously. There's a kind of softening into the fundamental reality of releasing, receiving, ending, creating, uh, passing away, arising, and together so fast, you, you, you can't even track the difference when you're really in the present, right at the emerging edge of now. And uh, there's a great dignity and this, the title of one of Sokni Rinpoche's uh, books, Carefree Dignity, because we can't control what's rushing through us. Like we're at the edge of a waterfall, a me metaphor I used in Buddha's brain, and the present is rushing on by and attempts to cling to it, creates suffering, and that's contraction, that's pressure. Uh, we can release our cares. We can be free of care in the burdensome sense of 
contraction and pressure, dread and doubt and helpless outrage, carefree, passing through, with also a quality of dignity somehow, not uptight, not weird, but there is a kind of carefree dignity, isn't there, in the experience, right in the present, of releasing, receiving together. You can walk through life, head high, letting go along the way. So how about we take a last few breaths here, or not our final breaths, but I mean, take a few moments here and feel your way into, if you like, even in an embodied way in your posture, a sense of kind of carefree dignity in the present. Not struggling to let go, just letting, just releasing as life moves through you and receiving continually. Life moves through you, aware, free of care, with dignity. You can be free of care while knowing you have things to do and being really concerned with compassion, but there's something peaceful and equanimous and released in the carefreeness that I'm talking about which has an uprightness and a self-respect and an engagement in the world. Releasing, receiving, carefree dignity. So may you be well, may you go well, and may you return next week for the next installment in this series uh, on uh, wise effort. Take good care.